Steve Trang, how are you doing today? I'm doing amazing. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, yeah. Do you like that forced intro where I went ahead and just said, Steve Trang? For me, this is like uh, after I started listening to your podcast, I'm like, dude, you're like one of the best real estate podcasters out there. And you remind me of the real estate Joe Rogan, somewhat. <laughs> it's an aspiration. I, I, I will take that as a compliment for sure. Absolutely. So for those of you that don't know Steve, um, kind of like myself, I have never met Steve, but he is a title company owner, uh, a, ho a wholesaler in the Phoenix market in Arizona. He owns a brokerage and he is the host of the hit podcast, Real Estate Disruptors. Dude, so glad to have you on. Thank you. Ah, oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Definitely my pleasure. It's an honor, man. So, you know, I, I never do this up front, but I feel like uh, shaking things up just because you're a special guest today. Um, I'll start off with a lot of the uh, rapid fire questions. I know some hosts do them, some hosts don't, but I've got some new rapid fire questions, but I'm going to start off with a little warm up and then we'll get into the more of the beefier rapid fire questions before we start this episode. How about that? Okay. Sounds great. All right. What's your favorite movie and why? I think you're a movie buff, kind of like me. So I'm kind of curious to find out. Oh, man. Uh, I go back to the classic. Uh, it's a, a few good men. You know, I can watch that over and over again. I don't know why. I can watch it over and over again. What is your guilty pleasure type of music, song, or artist? Guilty pleasure? Uh, this is probably embarrassing. Uh, Little Dicky. <laughs> awesome. What is your favorite book and why? Uh, Think and Grow Rich. Um, you know, that's just one that's, it's a classic. Um, and you can read it over and over again and get so many different things from it. I've, I read it when I first got into business and then I read it again 10 years into the business. And between when I first started and when I read it again, I'd read over a hundred books. Mm -hmm. And in reading it a second time, really listening, to be honest, a lot of the other books, I could have just listened to that book a hundred times and probably gotten more value than such reading a hundred different books. That's such a good book. So what, so when did you read a hundred books? Was that uh, just, throughout, just throughout my journey, right? Oh, Cause okay, I started yeah. in 2007. Yeah. Uh, and then I read, I listened to that book again. I want to say 2018. Right. Right. Yeah. Such a good book. Um, I, I believe no Napoleon Hill. He's got another one. Um, what's the outwitting the devil. Yeah. That's cool. It's really good, man. That's a really good one too. It is. Do you feel like you're a mindful investor or a buckshot investor? Shooting Ooh. off the chest. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm a quick decision maker. So if the numbers look pretty good, I'm good to go. And because it's come back to bite me a few times, but I don't know. I, I just I don't like to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Just just do it and move on. And you'll make you'll lose some money along the way, right. but you'll make more in the long run. Do you feel like you're a passive? Well, I think you just kind of answered this, but do you feel like you're more of a passive or aggressive um, investor in your work ethic or style? Very aggressive. <laughs> and, and this is actually, it translates probably a little bit from poker. Uh, you know, I'm playing poker. I'm just the one that's always willing to push all in before anybody else. If I feel like, like I've got this hand, I'm yeah. shoving the chips in. Do you, do you play poker a lot? Not so much anymore, but I used to play when I was growing, not growing up, when I turned 21, I played almost every weekend. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. I, I did too. That's, uh, that's what I did when I lost everything back in the recession in 08. I played online poker before it was banned and, uh, uh lost all that money, unfortunately, but did a lot oh. of online poker and tournaments, real life tournaments. I, man, I really love. Well, that's actually how I fed myself, uh, in the summer of 2003. Um, nice. So just playing poker at the casinos. To... We're going to come back to this because um, I'm sure throughout your podcast, I haven't listened to every one of them, but I've listened to quite a few. I have not caught that story. So I want to, I don't know if you've told it or. I don't think I've shared it. Well, let's, let's do a new, we'll go back to this. Two more questions for the warm ups, and then we'll get into more of a, you know, show, I guess. You feel like we're in a hyperinflation or a recession? Oh man. I mean, everything says recession, but it does not feel like recession. It feels like hyperinflation. Right. And I can tell you, I, I don't, I, I don't envy anybody that's got a W2 job right now. 
Yep, I agree. All right, so I'm going to have to actually read this one because <laughs> I just came up with this one. If you could go back to February of this year, right before we shut the country down, what advice would you give to yourself to help you have a better experience through it all? Or are you having the best time? <laughs> I had a great time. Um, I had a great time because we were already running lean on purpose. Right. Um, because I've been operating from a fear of paranoia for over a year, uh, thinking something was going to happen and looking forward to the next recession. Right. So we were geared for it. And we didn't lose any opportunities because of it. In fact, we made more opportunities with our existing relationships. Gotcha, gotcha. For those of you that, uh, for those of you listening that don't know Steve, um, he's got an interesting story. So I'm gonna just ask you, Steve, going back to you. I was talking to them now. I'm talking to you, obviously. <laughs> um, I'm so giddy because I'm having you here. I'm just, I, it's it, like I said, it's really an honor. What is your, what is your story like? if you could like just broadcast how you came uh, from being an engineer to a real estate guru, influencer, badass wholesaler over there, everything that you do, what took you from A to Z and how did the cookie crumble or build? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, so I, I, I started like a lot of guys in our, in our space, reading rich dad, poor dad mm -hmm. and learning that, you know, you got to get out of the rat race. And so I got into buying rental properties, got a lot of loans denied. So we actually didn't buy as many as we had intended because this is back in 07. Right. It was actually a blessing in disguise. Uh, but I, as we were trying to buy rental properties, I met a real estate broker uh, and I learned about investing, being a realtor, investing and so on. And I, I asked him like, what would I have to take to, what would, it, what would I need to do to learn everything that he knows? And he said, you go get your real estate license. I'll teach you everything I know. And from that point, from that dinner, I, it took me two and a half weeks to get my real estate license. And from there, I submitted my two weeks notice. Like, you know, not the due diligence, very fast decision making process. That was it. So from that dinner to four and a half weeks later, I was a licensed realtor, quit my Intel job, and I was all in. Huh. And so, but the problem is, I moved fast and I took my eye off the ball because Rich Dad Poor Dad didn't say go be a realtor. Rich Dad Poor Dad said get assets that cash flow so you're making money in your sleep. I didn't do that. I went from having a W-2 job to a higher paying job. Well, it was supposed to be higher paying. It wasn't um, because you, I didn't know as a realtor all the expenses you incur running a business. Um, and so I, I, for eight years, I was just going down the wrong path of not doing what I had intended to do, which was to acquire rental properties and get okay. passive cash flow. What path did you go down? I was a realtor. I was a realtor from 2007 and I still am, right? I'm a broker right. now, right. Uh, but I was pretty hands-on as a realtor. Um, did short sales, did foreclosures, um, and uh, eventually stumbled upon wholesaling on accident. I mean, I knew about wholesaling, my cousin, when I quit in 2007, he also quit in 2007. I went the realtor route. He went the flipping and wholesale route. And I told him, I was like, dude, this wholesale thing's a fad. You're, you're, you're making a lot of money now, but that's not the long-term play. Yeah. Turns out I was mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> and he's done very well for himself. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I finally learned on accident what wholesaling was, what it meant and what, how feasible it was. And that's really helped a lot in, in, in uh, yeah. getting to the point where rich dad, poor dad of acquiring properties and cash flow. Right. Right. So you have become the master wholesaler over there in Phoenix. And I wouldn't say master. I'm one of many, many names in our, uh, and, and we call it the, the Mecca capital, right? A guru capital. Yeah. Yeah. Of so, the world for wholesaling. Yeah. You guys have all kinds of trainings from all the big names over there on uh, Instagram and, and wherever mm -hmm. YouTube. Um, and I know you do a lot of sales training. Tell us about your sales training. Yeah. So uh, what we do, I, I'm very passionate about the psychology of sales. And this is probably because, um, you know, uh, I'm a recovering engineer. Uh, I like to know how things work. And so I went from being a really lousy salesperson. I was really successful despite being a lousy salesperson. Um, and I went from being a really lousy salesperson for, uh, to turn into one of my biggest strengths. And the reason why is because 
I really went all in on that as well. I really learned as much as I could uh, from my sales trainer. And in learning it, you realize how many people are doing it wrong. And I didn't know, like I just assumed that, you know, everyone else kind of knew how to do it. And I was just bad at it. But then as I've gotten better, I realized, wow, everyone's doing it wrong. Right. And it's so expensive, even more so today than it was even last year, to find a homeowner to get in their home or to book an appointment on the phone to, to have a conversation about them selling their house to you. Right. It is really cost prohibitive to, to let those leads and appointments die. Yeah. Right. Like if you can just improve, if you could just improve your conversion rate just by 10%, then you're probably increasing your bottom line by at least 30%. Right. Or more. And so it's so critical and people don't, I think they underestimate how important the sales skill is. Right, right. Well, I've got a friend of mine, uh, Gino Palomba. I think he uh, may know you. He yeah. asked me to ask you, um, what does going negative mean? Yeah, uh, going negative is just a uh, plain takeaway. Uh, it's uh, in high school uh, or maybe college. Right. I'll bet the girl that you chased the most was the one I was playing hardest to get. <laughs> Right. Right. right? Oh, and yeah. so, and so going negative is basically just allowing it's pulling away and then pulling you in. So I'll give you um, an example. Let's say I meet with you and you know, Mr. Uh, Thompson, you're talking about selling your home and you, and you say, well, you look at you, I want the most amount of money. So going negative here would be like, well, Brandon, you know what, if you're trying to get the most amount of money, you should probably go with a realtor because I'm not going to pay you the most. And then at this point, if you've got time, and options and money, then you say, yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But because we're talking here, you probably don't have time or money. So you really don't have those, that many options. So you're gonna say, well, you know, I don't have that much time. I need to get this done by this date, or you know, I don't have the money to do the rehab, or I just really want to move close to my grandkids by this certain time. They say, well, now you're selling me why you need to work with me versus me selling you why you need to work with me. Absolutely. Yeah. I've practiced that in my own business. That's uh, it's, 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 it's it sounds as fun. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. important to slowly become the expert that you need to be so that you can um, take care of everything. Cause uh, I, I mean, sales affect everything. I mean, it's just plain and simple. Let's uh, let's let's back up here. Let's talk about you starting in real estate with your four friends um, buying homes together in 2007. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the one where we're talking about we're getting our loans at night. It was that uh, we agreed we was JPSB a dream team. Okay. And that was our four initials. And we were going to each take turns getting qualified for mortgages to buy properties. Mm -hmm. Well, poor Brandon. He was the first one to get qualified for a mortgage. <laughs> so uh, the rest of us got our loans denied. Like I said, fortunately, that was a blessing in disguise. Right. So the only property we bought at that time was the only one that got foreclosed on. So, but you know, it, even through those times, we're still friends. We're still talking. We, we, we had known each other since middle school. So we we're close friends in middle school, great friends in high school, good friends still in college. And we went and we all read, we all read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah but unfortunately, he's the one that got the foreclosure. <laughs> what was uh, what was your biggest takeaway from that experience? Uh, you know, I can't say this without sounding braggadocious. Um, <laughs> but so the foreclosure we had was a flip. It was supposed to be a flip. So he bought the property. I want to say for like around three or two eighty, probably around two eighty. And then we put maybe like 15,000 into it. And the plan was to sell it for 350. That was the plan. But then this recession thing happened. And so we could no longer sell it for 350. We could only sell it for 310. So we would be breaking even for this whole endeavor that we've spent months rehabbing. And they're like, well, let's rent it out until things get better. And I was like, guys, no, the point was to flip this. Right. Um, the point was not to become property manager, not on this particular deal. This was up in Munns Park. And so what did we do? We turned it into a vacation rental. This is 2007. And the, at that time to, to keep it 
to pay the bills, we were using VRBO. So VRBO has been around for a very long time. Oh, yeah. So we were using VRBO.com back then to, to rent it out. And we broke even for many years, managing, working for free to break even. And so eventually we just said, screw it. We, and we let it go to foreclosure. But if they had, there's four of us, I was the only one that said, guys, let's sell it. Like we didn't buy this to be landlords in Munns in Mun's Park. I got overruled because there's three of them. So I would say the biggest takeaway is if you go in with a plan to flip it, exit with the flip strategy. Uh, don't try to, there are so many people that bought a flip where it went wrong and it becomes a rental. Yeah. Don't do that. Like, it's never a good situation to be a, a landlord unintentionally. What if, what if your flip goes backwards, but your worst case exit strategy in the back of your mind is the fact that you may turn that into a rental. Like say, actually, this is a real life example for me. Uh, I had a flip here outside of Atlanta in a suburb last year. Everything in, in its mother nature <laughs> can, yeah, started attacking the house, you know, contractors, mother nature, like just everything went wrong. Yeah. Um, I'm all in at $140,000. The property's worth 165. If I was a seller, I'd break even or I would lose money possibly a couple thousand dollars. But then with the quantitative easing uh, uh, from the Fed this year and interest rates going so low, a three and a half percent interest rate, I am at, um, I do have a little bit of skin in the game, but not a lot. Not a lot. I got all of my money back except for $20,000 that we went over. So I'm $20,000 in cash on cash return uh, is, is, I don't even know what it is, but it's really nice. I'm, I'm renting this thing out all in PITI for $600 a month and $120,000 note, and I'm getting $1,200 a rent. You think it's easier to have a backup strategy like that now? Yeah, at, I think if you go point? in with multiple exit strategies yeah, and one strategy doesn't work, then switch to the other, other exit strategies. Okay, cool. But this is a vacation rental. There were no other exit strategies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trust me, I know, I know. Yeah, there's yeah. often, oftentimes with a short-term rental backfire. Yeah. You're, but you're if you go in with a possibility that it could be a rental, then yeah, turn it into a rental, right? It was just, if that was something that you're okay with, but how many people have we bought homes from that were landlords, because, not because they wanted to be. It was just, they turned out, it just became rentals, whether through inheritance or a bad flip or whatever. We talked to those tired landlords all the time. Yeah, and it's uh, tell you, I tell you what, why don't you tell us about one of your worst stories in real estate and then one of the best ones you can remember, whether you're wholesaling, you're flipping, you're renting, whatever it is that you were doing at the time. Why don't you tell us one of your horror stories and one of your awesome successes? Uh, I mean, the worst story I always say is that I bought a deal, again, not, to, not doing the proper due diligence, right. bought a deal from a buddy. And I didn't notice, you know, we're just doing quick comps, dirty comps, whatever. Um, didn't notice that it was a, it was very close to train tracks and that there were other multifamilies on the same street. You know, like it's just very quick and dirty analysis. It was, so we lost 18,000 on that one. That was just last year. And so, like I said earlier, we moved very quickly, but I would say as far as like bad stories, it doesn't have to do with real estate specifically, but more entrepreneurship in general. I don't know uh, who are the target audience that's listening to this, but one of the things that happens in your journey is if you're married, like entrepreneurship is very tough. It's really hard. Being married to an entrepreneur isn't that much better. <laughs> and so for me, starting 2007, I had all the confidence in the world. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crush it, blah, blah, blah. I didn't. I, I, I stunk up the joint. In my worst year, my expenses exceeded my revenue by 50,000. Mm. Like my 1040 was negative 50,000 where the, my accountant who still charged me to do my taxes, of course, was like shaking his head like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have anything to say besides I'm sorry, right? right? So for a few years, the D word was dropped around the house a lot mm. because it's really stressful. Um, so. I would say that was probably the toughest story and we're fine now, but man, it was a really tough few years. H asking someone to believe in you that you're, 
you're right around the edge of turn the you're, you're right there right about to turn the corner but the truth matter is you don't really know when you're going to turn that corner right it feels like it's there but you really don't know when it's going to happen oh yeah yes 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 i agree i um i have no comment i think you're right on this i think you're right there on the dot i mean it's it is it is definitely tough to be an entrepreneur uh especially when you're a serial entrepreneur like you are uh to mm -hmm. do this for all these years and and to make it unscathed you're never going to come out unscathed like nobody's going to have a flawless career mm -hmm. um and that's that's kind of what i teach through the podcast and through my uh my my business dealings and some of the people that work with me um do the work and it's okay to get your nose you know rubbed raw on the, on the pavement it's it's yeah. going to happen it's going to happen it's not if it's going to happen yeah <laughs> that's just the process absolutely yes yeah. what is one of your best successes in real estate it could be monetary it could be like oh we just helped out this awesome family mm -hmm. um, you you can define best or most successful tell us what is the most successful deal you've ever pulled off in your career uh, I wouldn't say any specific deal and this might be a sidetrack, but I would say starting a podcast. Um, uh, one of the things that's been really important to me and one of our core values, we have five core values, growth, impact, value, excellence, and service yeah. and impact. When we started the podcast, that's been the biggest. So when I started the brokerage back in January of 13, um, I had in my mind, I wanted to create 18 millionaires and that came directly from thinking grow rich, mm -hmm. you know, from, from, um, Andrew Carnegie. Right. That was just direct influence from Andrew Carnegie from that book. Anyway, when I started the podcast, in my mind, it was going to be successful. I was going to try. If it failed, it failed. Who cares? Right. But in my mind, it was going to be successful. And I said, for it to be successful, we need to create 100 millionaires. Yeah. And so the, the messages I get all the time about how, you know, I just did these deals from your podcast. And they didn't have to sign up for training. They didn't have to sign up for coaching. Now I have training program. Right? I have coaching and so on. But I tell people, you don't need me to be successful. The podcast alone is enough. Right. And so getting these messages every once in a while, like, you know, I was able to do A, B, and C because your podcast, that was, I would say that feeds me, that feeds my soul right. more than anything else. Yeah, man. I mean, you're, you're inspiring, you're educating, you're giving people hope. Um, and then you're telling people, or, or you're narrating these awesome stories with other entrepreneurs all across the country. And it's just making people have the faith that they can do it. I mean, that's, that's what it's doing. Uh, the episodes that I've listened to have been phenomenal. You're a very good podcast host. You, thank you. You're, you're really, um, what's, you are very like you're energetic in a um, slow form. If that makes sense. Like, like me yesterday, I was interviewing actually somebody around the corner from you, Steve, Steve Valentine from uh, Paoria, mm -hmm. you know, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I was uh, interviewing him yesterday. I'm a uh, part of the mastermind that he's in with Chris, Chris Harder. And mm -hmm. actually, actually I'll be coming out on your side of town in about six, five or six weeks in uh, Williams, cool. Williams, Arizona or so. Um, with that said, yeah, I, you know what? I just had a brain fart. I don't know what happened. This is real life people. This uh, just, this just happened. <laughs> what was I talking about? That is, that is the dumbest We're thing. We're talking about the podcast. Yes, 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 yes. Like you have this, you have this slow energy that, um, uh, you know, I get excited. I'm just bouncing all over the place. How do you, how do you contain yourself? Like, how do you just not go like just flabbergast and, and just get tongue tied and just keep on going for the slow kill? Uh, you know, I think for me, it's about pulling the story out of the other person. And I really enjoy that. And I think yeah. one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much is because I've listened to so many podcasts where the host was the hero. Yeah. And I can't stand it. Like you brought on this awesome guest and I've watched it with other phenomenal speakers, like world-class speakers and they'll have other people on and they're always interjecting themselves. Right. And I, I just can't watch those or listen to those episodes. Uh, and so for me, I was very intentional from day one, the person that comes on the show, they're the hero. And it's my job to just uh, pull the story out of it for the listeners. Yeah, you cur you curate a really good show, and uh, I'll be honest that uh, I mean you curate a really strong narrative, and you do pull that story out of them and make them the hero. That is a hard thing to do for a podcast yeah. host. Um, 
I mean, you're the Larry King or you're the Joe Rogan. Like, man, that is a special talent. So, man, it's uh, that's well, inspiring. you know what's crazy is I used to do that all the time over lunch because I would say, hey, Brandon, you know, I see what you're doing. You're having all the success in town. Can I buy you lunch? And, you know, maybe 30 percent of people will say yes. And then we have lunch and I would bring my list of questions with me because there's nothing more aggravating than someone asking you to have lunch or pick your brain and they come and they've got no agenda. So I would always come intentional. Uh, and there was a book, John Maxwell, good leaders ask great questions. So I'd come with my questions ready to maximize both of our times. Right. And so what this happened on the podcast is really what I've been doing for years over lunch. It's just the camera's on now. Yeah. Tell us about why uh, and I've, I've, I believe I've heard the answer, but for the, the listeners here in this podcast, why you chose to have everybody fly in and to film every single time versus doing a digital Zoom call like this one here? Uh, I just want it to be different. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I, there's a lot of podcasts out there. There's no shortage of real estate podcasts out there. Oh, yeah. And for me, I was thinking if I really want to make a dent like Steve Jobs says, make a dent in the universe. For me to be different, this is what I'm gonna do. I have the great fortune of being in Phoenix because again, we're the guru capital of the world. Yeah. I was able to start it off the first few episodes with just Phoenix. There was plenty of people in Phoenix to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And then I actually had Brent Daniels, you know, we were talking and I said, hey, this is my vision. And he said, if that's your vision, stay true to it. This is awesome. Do not deviate no matter what. Right. And it's not, uh, it wasn't easy. Like in COVID had all these people that have wanted to come on the show. And I've always said, sorry, can't do it. Can't do it unless you're willing to fly out. And they were looking at it as like, well, now there's COVID, you have to do this way. And I said, no, I don't. I just took three, I just took three months off. Right. That's all I did. I just focused on other stuff for three months. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, yeah, that's great, man. That's, it's brilliant. I, uh, man, you've had, you've had some really inspiring, in you've had some really informative guests that just just hammered down with just great stories great knowledge and they're dropping the hammer and it's uh or the mic i mean it's it's i don't know i mean i feel like you have and, and i'm not throwing you out there uh and just saying this but i feel like you are probably the top podcaster in the real estate space even though you've been only doing this for two two years um dude i mean Yours is, in my opinion, right there at the top, and then you you have a few others. Um, yeah, I just got I just got to catch bigger pockets. Yeah, I know. I I I was uh, I saw your multiple downloads you did the uh, or the the number of downloads you had the mm -hmm. other day. I think you're gonna overtake them. I think you're gonna get that momentum. I don't know. I mean, I was looking at the metrics actually. Uh, I think this morning because uh, I'm 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 revamping my website, and I was looking, and we're about. 4,000. So we're top 10% of downloads, but to get to top 1%, we've got to 10X our numbers. Yeah. So I have to figure out how to 10X our numbers. That's, that's, a, that's the next fun endeavor. I actually hired a videographer to help me do that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, the, the, uh, the bigger pockets guys, they're great uh, people. I've never talked to them, never met them. Um, yeah, I that's all the dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, cool, man. Well, I want to ask you this question. How do you get your foreclosure listings? Oh, so going back to what I was saying earlier about uh, you know, doing short sales on foreclosure. So I was in a crunch in 2009. So like I said, 2008, I lost 50,000. 2009 was a make or break year. And one of the reasons why I felt comfortable taking the leap for real estate was that no matter what, I killed it in engineering, I could always get a job in engineering. Yeah. 2009, my back was against the wall. And you know what? I actually called my old boss back and he's like, We're actually can't, we actually can't hire right now. So. Now my back's really against the wall, right? And so I have to get foreclosure. I have to get these foreclosure listings. There's just no other way if I'm going to survive because there's doing traditional real estate was not going to survive. Was not going to feed, uh, pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And so I've been applying through the front door. You know, going to BankofAmerica.com, Wells Fargo, Chase, and Fannie Mae's websites, and applying through the front door to be a listing agent. And the fact of the matter is that door was sealed shut. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was just no going in. Not only was I not getting uh, denials, 
I wasn't getting squat, right? Like you can submit all your resumes all you want. It was just going in a heap with everyone else's resumes. And so I said, again, I've got to do something different. So what I did was I flew out to one of their conferences. I knew there was a conference that was going to be in Dallas, Texas. So I flew out there and I said, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And I flew out there um, actually uh, with my wife. And um, I said, I'm going to figure this out. And so you think as, you know, as an agent or whatever, that these bankers are going to be like old men, you know, 55, 50, 55, making decisions because these are assets that they need to maximize for the bank. No, these are 25 year old kids. The people are making decisions on what to sell the property for, for Wells Fargo, for Chase, for Fannie Mae, are just kids, just like <laughs> any other wholesaler. Right. And so I, I go out there, it's like, holy crap, that's it? Yeah. And so you talk to them, say, hey, what are you doing later on? Like, we're going to the bar. It's like, okay, so let's go drinking. Yeah. So we go drinking, whatever. It's like, what's going on next? And I'm buying drinks, okay? Like I'm just buying everyone drinks because this is how the real world works. And so we're like, well, we're going to this club later on. Me too. So it goes to the club and I pay for bottle service, right? This is just like back in college when you're trying to, you know, hook up, you, you get, you get bottle service and so on. And so I would actually go and pay, like, I don't think it was terribly expensive, relatively speaking, because there were other agents doing the same thing, Mm -hmm. but you know, you spend $1,500. That's a, that's the tab that's split four ways for bottle service, but now you get listings. And so the front door, you can try, you can do it the right way, okay? And the right way, it may work, but it probably won't. So you have to get get creative. You have to really figure things out and figuring it out really was just like going to where they are, figure out what, you know, they're humans, figure out what makes them happy and in this instance, it was lots and lots of alcohol and lots and lots of bottle service. So what I'm hearing is active listening and participation, a few beers, mm-hmm. <laughs> and relationship capital. Relationship, absolutely. And I remember like going to Denver um, and, and doing the same thing because you have to, it, it's not just once, right? You got to prime the pump. So you got to right. keep doing this. So every time there's an event, you go. I was stumbling back to my hotel like three o'clock in the morning, like walking by myself, like these guys were able to get home, whatever. And there's no Uber at this time. Right. So like they get their way home and I would walk from the bars and the clubs back to my hotel three o'clock in the morning, still in my suit, just a big mess and still have to wake up at six o'clock, just three hours later to come to one of the, the, the classes, because this is all like how to be a better agent how to be better, provide better service to the banks. And so I'd be out drinking till three and then wake up at 6 a.m. to show up for a class at 7 a.m. on how to be a better agent. Right. Dude, man, that's, that's killer, man. That's a, so you put your nose to the grindstone, you're doing the work, you're building up the, the relationships by the active listening and participation. And then it's, there's no wonder why you're successful. I mean, that's, that's um you got a lot of people that are just sitting there on the sidelines and just watching and they're not doing anything and if they are they're complaining complaining about it because they're doing it the wrong way yeah. what would you say to people uh, after the story you just told with that uh, pair with it for extra context what would you say to those people right now that are just listening to the podcast and they're just thinking they're going to go get something done whether it's rentals or wholesaling or whatever that it is that they want to do but they're just not doing it yeah it's are you willing to do what it takes um there's something that uh, um i've gone through darren hardy's insane productivity and one of the things he has in there is the give up list Mm -hmm. what are you willing to give up to live the life that you want Mm -hmm. and so for me um even till recently i was very much into sports uh watching nfl direct uh, direct ticket i think it is yeah. And every and you know, watch the Sunday morning games, Sunday afternoon games, Sunday night games, Monday night games, Thursday night games, because that's what it takes to be competitive in fantasy sports, which I've been doing for a very, very long time. And so, and that's just like a personal thing. It's a fun thing, right? But yeah. 
last year was the first year I actually said, Hey, you know what? I'm out of our league. I'm not, I'm not doing it this year. I, I can't take, I can't take my eye off what I need to, to do what I want to do to accomplish what I want to accomplish, which I still have big aspirations. I can't, I can't continue watching sports. Right. So I'm out. I'm done with the fantasy league. And the answer was you can't quit. It was like trying to quit like the Crips. It's like, you can't leave. It's like, I can't leave. It's like, you can't leave. <laughs> you know, are you willing to do what it takes? Are you willing to give up what, you know, fun? Like, I don't watch TV shows. I, I have Netflix only to watch movies. I, I won't start a TV show because I know, me personally, I will finish it. I will finish it. If I, if I start Tiger King, I will finish Tiger King. So I'm not going to start it. All right. But these are things I have to do in order to accomplish the kind of goals I want to accomplish. Absolutely. Do you feel like you, um, you get easily sucked into, uh, you have an addictive personality maybe? Oh, for sure. Going back to that poker thing. I played every single weekend. I played so often that when I was late on a Friday, they knew I was late. Yeah. Do you feel like that's an entrepreneurial trait, like a serial, not just an average, but a serial entrepreneurial trait? Like you have that addictive personality. That's a good question. I don't know, but I do know that those guys I was playing poker with, two of them were millionaires because they had their own businesses. And so we would actually talk on Saturdays about their other stuff. So could be, I'm not sure. Yeah. What do you think about uh, the entrepreneurs that play golf on the weekends or, or during the week and they're doing deals on the golf course? I've never been one of those guys. I'm more like you. Uh, um, but what do you think about you, you, you might like playing golf. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> kind of like the Jerry Seinfeld episode, which I know they're talking about something different. There's nothing wrong with it, but I've just never been that person. What do, yeah. you, what do you feel about that? Uh, I think that that satisfies your needs. If it, yeah. satisfies, if it fulfills your soul, then yeah. I think that's great. I don't, golf is an amazing networking yeah. uh, uh, hobby, right? Like there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and if it were up to me, I'd probably play more poker, you know? <laughs> Um, but for me, I know I can't do what I want to do playing golf. I just know it won't work. I mean, I'm trying to catch, trying to catch bigger pockets. Terrific. I'm trying to catch Dave Ramsey, you know, I'm podcasting. Uh, I'm trying to be the number one guy in the country in sales. Um, I'm trying to catch Jordan Belfort and Grant Cardone. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I can't do those things if I'm golfing, the, just the leverage you get from the relationships from golf at least locally, it won't be enough. How does your, uh, I, I assume you're married, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know you said wife earlier. How, how does your wife feel about all the business that you're doing and, and to the extreme aggressiveness that you're playing in on the, on the football field? Yeah. Well, she thinks I'm crazy. In fact, I remember one year I was saying something to her and she's like, A, no. And B, you have to promise me between now and the, S and the rest of the year, you will not start any new businesses. And I think this was like in October. I was like, okay, I can commit to not starting any new businesses for three months. That's something I can commit to. <laughs> and then you're secretly behind the scenes coming up with like three new businesses. <laughs> you're just waiting for that three month period to be up. <laughs> you know, and the great thing is for us as entrepreneurs, there's actually no shortage of opportunities. There really aren't. Right. And so, the discipline that I had to gain was, was saying no. So it's not cause we can, I can go tomorrow and start five new businesses. It will completely take away from my existing businesses. Okay. So, but if I, if I were to go right now on Facebook, it's like, Hey, you know what? I'm thinking about starting some ideas, some businesses who wants to join me, who's got some ideas. I could tomorrow start five new businesses, right? but it would, the, the cost to me in starting those businesses would be way too high compared to what I have going on right now. You know, I'll, I'll use another example. Talking about earlier about the give up list. Right. Uh, I'm a big time computer nerd. Mm -hmm. So I played Diablo uh, and Diablo 2. And Diablo 3 came out, I want to say like six, seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. And for me, I was looking at, it wasn't the $50 that it was going to cost to buy the game or the $180 for the video card. That wasn't the cost to me. The cost to me, was the distraction and how and how tired I would be the next day because I know I'm going to stay up late playing that game. Hmm. So it's not the uh, again, it's not the 180 and the 50. It's gonna be how many thousands of dollars will it cost me 
to play Diablo three. Yeah. Well, that, that right there, everybody that's listening, that is what is key that you need to put in your mindset. All the stuff that you're doing that is not actively producing a benefit to the life that you want to live. There you go. Steve just dropped the mic. <laughs> Oh man, dude, this has been a fun episode. Um, what's what is uh, what what do you feel like you're? Where do you feel like you're going to be in the next year, five years, and then ten years, and everything that you're doing? Well, where my hope, to be? my dream, really is like I said, as a sales trainer, and this is like I'm having a book. Um, we should be publishing it hopefully by the end of October. Right. Um, maybe you know, sales is about the. It's, it's all. It's going to be all about sales, and so my hope really is just to be, you know, an, a renowned uh, speaker and influencer. Um, I put uh, on my, um, on my uh, vision, not vision board, I'm not really a visually based person, but my vision is, is all written down in Evernote is I actually put in there for the longest time I wanted to buy the Cardinals because the Arizona Cardinals are trash. And so I was going to say, I am going to rescue this franchise. Like that's kind of like my thing, right? We my, my friends and I. But earlier this year, I erased it. I got challenged by some friends, like, you know, I don't really care about sports anymore. They're like, well, then get rid of that. So I erased buying the Cardinals and I replaced it with being cell phone buddies with Tony Robbins. Yeah. Like, that's who I aspire to be, to be at that level where he would actually not just take my call, but we can actually have conversations. Yeah. That's, where, that's, that's my hope in 10 years. In a year, hopefully I'm a nationally known sales trainer. I don't know, but that's where I want to be in, in five to 10 years. That's awesome. Well, what are some parting, what is some parting advice that you can give the audience um, to jumpstart their career or to push them further down their career? Yeah. So I would say that despite the, the, the constant chaos right now and the, the incessant barrage of negative news out there, there's never been a better time to be alive and there's never been a better country on the planet. And so go out there and get what's yours because you can get everything you want without hurting people. You can, right? You can get, you can have anything in life you want. So long as you're willing to help enough people, that's Zig Ziglar. Yeah. And I, I have found this to be true even more so after starting the podcast, the life I have today has been amazing for me, but it's, it didn't change dramatically until I started the podcast. I'm the same person as when I started the podcast. But my life changed when I was able to help more people. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, man, you're one of the most humble, most humblest guys I've interviewed, man. It's 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 been a pleasure here. Um, where can people find you? Where where on the socials and what's the name of your podcast? One last time for yeah. two people that may not know about you. <laughs> uh, yeah, the best way to get hold of me is on Instagram at Steve Trang S T E V dot T R E N G. Um, I'm very responsive there. Well, I'm going to say very responsive. I'm always responsive. It might take a few days to get back to you, but I always respond to everybody. Uh, that's something that's important to me. Um, otherwise, real estate disruptors. Um, you know, you go to realestatedisruptors.com. You can look it up on, on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. Um, but we're, we're everywhere that you can find us at least. Um, so I, I, I would love to, to help anybody that, you know, needs help getting getting started getting motivated whatever awesome awesome well steve it's been a pleasure until next time um hopefully this has been a good experience for you it's been a great uh, experience <laughs> well thank you well i will hope to see you sooner or later and uh we will talk to you soon all right thank you if you have an opinion go ahead and comment below i actually read all the comments and respond to them Hit that like button and subscribe if you want more REI Society information.